Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest, NCAA champion, the first man ever to break 50 seconds in the 100-yard breaststroke, former American record holder. Today, we're talking to Ian Finnerty. Hey, guys. Totally botched that. You are an American record holder, so I'm sorry. No one else has been under. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> don't listen to me. Uh, so to, today we're sitting down with you, Ian, because uh, I, I, according to according to you, you're done swimming uh, at least for the present. Can you can you take us through that? And especially the last couple months, obviously, we know there's been coaching changes at Alabama where you were training. Um, can you take us through these last couple months and what led up to this decision for you? So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say done for sure, but more than likely uh, just for the immediate future. So obviously I've been moving around quite a bit the last six months. I mean, I was in Turkey for three months and then out to Alabama. Um, so after Budapest, after ISL, we were kind of told that we wouldn't be able to go back to Turkey, obviously, for a lot of reasons, most, mostly being covid uh, there was concern that a lot of for me, it wouldn't have been as much of a concern because the U.S. was pretty open about you wouldn't have to quarantine when you get back, but there was concern for the European guys that if they went there and had to come back before trials, they'd be subjected to a two week quarantine. And then that'd be a whole mess of trying to taper around that and train obviously. So for me, it wasn't as big of a reason, but I wouldn't have been able to train out there because there would have been no coach. So I ended up moving out to Alabama to train with Coley um, and uh, Ryan and all them and, then the situation at Alabama happened where Coley left as the head coach, um, which caused some issues with the training groups. And honestly, since 2020, I got pushed back the first time I had finished my master's. And I had, during that time, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of ready to move on from swimming after 2020. So when the whole Olympics got delayed for a year, I, I don't know really the whole time if I was 100% in it because I kind of decided that I wanted to move on and do something else. Um, so just a culmination of things really led to the decision. No, no one real thing um, or event really decided it for me. It was more everything together at that point in time. After having some time to reflect and just kind of sit on this decision, does it, does it feel like the right one for you at this time? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I was doing my master's at IU back in like 2019, I kind of decided that 2020 I would be done. Really. I, I had a lot of passion for other hobbies and, you know, just actually pursuing a professional, um, uh, like a, a professional career. I wanted to work with other sports. I wanted to get involved with MotoGP, UFC or anything else. And so kind of when the Olympics got delayed, it was, um, it almost kind of, kind of felt hard for me to continue to, to swim because I kind of made a pact to myself that I, I would actually be done. So moving around obviously didn't help that. Um, I didn't get to see my family as much. Uh, there was a lot of unknown and uncertainty like everybody else is facing with COVID. Um, so right now, yeah, it definitely feels good. I mean, I'm trying to pursue other, other passions that, that I've had, other hobbies. Um, I've got to spend more time with my family and friends and I'm really more intrinsically motivated now to actually pursue a professional career. Um, I'm talking with a lot of other big companies right now, hopefully in the final stages of being involved with the graduate program and, and some of the companies. So that to me brings me more excitement, more joy than swimming has over the course of the last year. Um, and I say the last year, cause I mean, I, I love swimming collegiately. I loved being with my, my teammates. It wasn't, it's not a resentment for the sport. It's just that I didn't feel like I was doing it for myself for the last year or so. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you had a great career, but I think that that second Olympic year is a really hard one to get, get over for, for a lot of athletes. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of athletes kind of make the similar decision of, okay, my collegiate career is done. I'm, I'm ready to move on and, and do other things in life. 
uh, like you said, you've gotten time to spend with family and friends. I mean, how has it been just not having to show up at the pool every morning or every day? So it's, it's been good. And I think it's been, uh, really kind of bad because as swimmers and as uh, elite athletes, you develop this habit of, you know, getting, um, sort of in a groove of hard work and, and, you know, being dedicated to something. And now that I wake up, I, I think, well, what am I going to do today? I, I need a, a structured plan of what I'm going to do this whole week because that's what I'm used to. And right. It's like a double-edged sword. I mean, I have this work ethic that's just been pushed into me every single day since being a little kid age group swimmer, but it, it's, it's sometimes hard to find, you know, time to relax because I always want to be doing something. I always want to be improving on something. And so picking up other hobbies is usually the way to do that. And like, I started rock climbing in college, but with COVID, you know, the gyms are closed and everything. So right now it's especially hard. So I've decided to like do other hobbies that don't require me to go out somewhere. Like I've been reading a lot and obviously taking time to apply to jobs and such, but overall, I think it's a net positive. It's, it's been nice to kind of be free to decide what I'm going to do the day, be free to wear to direct my physical exertion for the day. Cause you know, after some practice, you were so dead. Um, it was kind of hard to do that stuff. You're, you're mentally and physically drained. So it's been nice to be fresh going into those sort of things. Yeah. Do you, <clears throat> you, you know, you mentioned you're applying for jobs and, and you'd like to still work in sports, but with other sports, what sparked that, you know, hobby or passion for you and, and what, area do you are you trying to break into now so i mean i i always love sports i i played baseball in high school um i always have watched sport and when i went to college i actually wasn't trying to go into any sort of sport management or sport marketing i was doing more science background stuff and sophomore year i switched over to sport marketing and management and i i, I found a true passion with you know i've had this experience I think I'll be able to touch other people's and younger athletes' lives and make theirs better by using the experiences that I've had. And I think that's where the passion for that came from. Um, as far as other sports, any, any extreme sports been fascinating for me. I mean, swimming's not the most extreme sport. Anybody will tell you that. I mean, it's pretty bland as far as that goes. So I've always had an interest in, you know, MotoGP, the guys in the motorcycles going so fast, Formula One, they're also going fast. So it's just, anything along those lines has always been interesting for me. And some of the companies like, hopefully, um, obviously don't want to jinx it. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but I'm in the kind of the final rounds for a graduate program through Red Bull and their dis distribution market. So it's, that would be just kind of a dream job for me, you know, getting their campaigns organized for 2021, working with some of their sports that they have. Cause I mean, it, they're synonymous with extreme sports. So that's just something that I'd be super passionate about. But yeah. I, 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 you said Red Bull, and the first thing that came to mind was, yeah, that's pretty. That's about as extreme as it gets in, yeah. terms, <laughs> in terms of sports. Um, there, yeah, I mean, they they really push it to the next level. But that's super cool. Mm -hmm. Hope hopefully you end up, you know, on your feet and able to land yep. whatever you're pursuing. Um, I, and you know, what better time than now to just kind of take a look back at at your swim career thus far? You know, I don't want to jinx it, and you said you're done for now, <laughs> but, right. uh, you know, I mean, the first guy to break 50 in the, in the hundred yard breaststroke. And I have to start there because when did that become a, a goal for you? Yeah. So I actually vividly remember where I was when I was actually writing down goals, um, for breaststroke in general. So in high school, um, I had Candace lose, obviously is my high school coach, Ray's, Ray's wife. And we had decided to write down goals that I wanted in a one to five to 10 year increments. And I, I remember writing down 49 for the hundred yard breast because at the time Kevin had already been 50. I think I actually watched Kevin do that and then wrote down 49. Cause I was like, Oh, he's so close. Somebody can surely do that. And then I want to say at the time I had written down, 50 like seven eight in meters and then pd you know just decided to just cut that <laughs> way down so i was like oh i'll be the first one under that and then i was like oh maybe not i think he's gonna do it but um i was i was sitting in like photography class in high school and i was like i'm gonna do this and then ever since then it was kind of it stayed in the back of my mind it wasn't very 
because at the time I was like 54, maybe 54 or five. So it wasn't like very doable at the time. But then come sophomore year, I think I was 51 one. And that's when I kind of decided, you know, I think this is doable. Like I, I've dropped this much time in this short period of time. So I think we should reevaluate and actually look at this. And I think junior, junior year, the training up into that point was, was very spot on for that goal. Um, I mean, we had taken breakdowns of Kevin's race, how fast was he to the 15, put a tempo trainer into that exact time, try to beat it off the block. So it was, that's when it got serious, but the idea was in the head. I mean, junior year of high school. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so that was pretty instilled in you by that time. And it, I mean, I'm guessing that was the five-year goal and you, you, it took four years to, yeah. to get there. Yeah. And that, that, that was the five-year goal was to get, get to that point and it happened. So I think that definitely ingrained some, you know, goal setting mindset in, into me like, Oh, if you make these mini goals, like it'll work out like they always say. So. Yeah, that's that's definitely when it came about, and I'm glad it came to fruition. Now, I, I, I'd like to dive into that junior year of training because, like you said, you, you broke down Kevin's Kevin's race, the 50.04, but also that year you were top eight in the 200 IM, in the 200 breast. Do you – I mean, it, you can't you can't train sprint and do, and do that, especially not at NCAAs when you're swimming – out of 10 plus races over the course of three and a half days. Right. Can you take me through how you trained for not only breaking 50, but for, you know, going, I think 142, 2 I am 132, yeah. 200 free, 149, 200 breast. Yeah. So I honestly, a, a lot of the training was, was middle distance. I mean, I, I had a huge range that year. Um, it was definitely the year I did the most yards for sure. That's because I knew I was going to be doing this 200 IM two free. I had a sprint day on Wednesday and then a sprint day kind of on Thursday. And that, that was it. That was as, as much as we did sprint. And then I had middle distance on a Tuesday, a Monday basically. And then I was doing over distance IM work on Friday afternoon with Westfall. So I was doing almost 8,000 Friday IM. I mean, it was nothing too anaerobic i mean some of the sets we did was we would do you know like 15 200s i am and it would be on 230 so it's not like it's fast but still by the end of it, you're like okay then when is this going to be done um <laughs> or a thousand i am for time and stuff like that so there was nothing really sprint um i'd say being with uh mark hill and coley some of those days was was really nice because up until that point i hadn't done any sprint sophomore year was like nothing um so there was a good mix and I think I had to do that to be able to swim those events. Like you said, I was doing more 200s at the meet than I was doing hundred. I mean, I had the 200 IM, 200 free and 200 breast. So obviously we had to be in, in good shape for that. Um, so that's definitely, it was definitely more of a mid distance. Some people will consider distance training for, for that year with a lot of technical stuff though, during the, uh, sprint days. I mean, that's, that's what the focus was. It was like, your tempo needs to be this. You need to be at this point, seven seconds into the race. Cause that's where Kevin was. You need to be at this point at the wall. So there was a lot of technical, very precise things, but the bulk of the training was an aerobic background. I, I, I love hearing that just because again, I it's, yeah, I don't think you can just train sprint and, and be able to bring it home to go a 49 mm -hmm. or at least that's you know that wasn't the case for you but the especially the that front end of the race like you said so much technical stuff did was there right. was there technique things you were working on at all yeah we had played around with a lot of things i mean obviously that would have been 2018 i believe um so i i had watched pd's race a hundred times probably and trying to figure out what he's doing and how we translate that to yards um especially the back half of his race, you see his head comes down and makes a nice even plane on the water. He's his hips get high. So that was sort of what we were trying to create with the TiVo system and all the video cameras at IU. So that's kind of where the technique stuff went, seeing where my pole was and then just going from there. And obviously it, it worked out really well. And like you said, you can't bring it home, but then it's like, okay, we have to make a trade off. Do we want to be out faster or do we want to be back faster? So it's, it's kind of difficult to say which one's better. And I mean, I'd always struggled with speed 
like in the relays. So we, we had to figure that out. I mean, I was 22, nine, I think that year on flying medley and then out 23, one in the hundred breast. So it's like, we, there was still some movement for room for improvement there, but uh, the back half was somewhere where I excelled. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, going into that next season, the 2018, 19 season, you were still 49, eight at the end of the season to win in C's. What was different about that season for your training and, and, I'm guessing what something that might've affected that is just the team makeup in general as well. Yeah. I think, um, after I had, well, at that point we were trying to make the 200 a little bit stronger. That, that was kind of our goal. Cause we decided, you know, the hundred is looking good. Let's try to throw more back end and more aerobic work in to see if we can get the 200 faster. Cause I mean, the goal was to be like 148, 149 and the 200, try to win again. Cause we knew obviously Andrew was going to be super fast. I mean, I had barely clipped him in the year before and I was dying. So there's, there was that mindset going into it. Yeah. The makeup of the coaching staff was, was different. And just some of the work that I was doing was more back in loaded. Um, overall, there wasn't much. I mean, sometimes it's just too tense. Like I always tell people is you just reaching a little bit more. So it's just, uh, you never know what the, the issue is to, it's hard to control all the variables and obviously to figure out what thing works the best. You have to have all these constants and sometimes in college swimming, that's really hard. You're changing four or five variables every year. So it's kind of impossible to know. This is the thing that made it faster. Like, like I, I stopped doing over distance. I am senior year and it's like, well, was that it? But there's so many other things I was doing differently too, that it's kind of hard to say what was working and what wasn't, but overall senior year was a great meet. Um, but yeah, it was, I would say the only thing that was different is a little less sprint work and a little more just over back end work. So, okay. Interesting. Um, and then just getting your personal perspective on things, you know, can you, can you take us through some of your career highlights when you look back, you're going to say, you know, the, these are some of my favorite memories. Cause I, I know, I certainly have things that I might point to, but I, I, I'd like to hear yours if you've got them. So I think it's hard because, you know, you have these achievement highlights and, you know, they're, they're as far as accolades go, I mean, yeah, my hundred yard breast is probably number one of the multi NCAA titles, but it, it's so odd because sometimes those aren't the most vivid memories you have. And right. I think the most vivid race, and I tell people this all the time, and it's like, it's because you never raced freestyle. That's why. But the 800 freestyle relay, um, when when we got second junior year, that's the most vivid race I, I can possibly remember is I, I remember Blake, you know, breaking the record on the leadoff, then going up against Justin Ress. And I, I almost can like remember each individual lap of that race. And then the 100 rest is a blur. Like I barely remember any of it. So, and that's probably just because the shock and, you know, all the adrenaline pumping, but that that's probably one of the biggest highlights for me is that 800 free relay we did, the medley relay, winning that with the guys. And honestly, dual meets, like some of the dual meets we're in were, were almost more exciting for me because it's, it's just more of a team aspect, not necessarily swimming individually um, as much as you are at NCAAs. And then I think finally, probably Olympic trials, 2016. I remember that really well, just because I, I had no expectations going into it. I think I was like 60th seed. I was like a 103 before the meet. I'd barely made the cut. And then I was, I think I made it into the semi and then didn't obviously qualify for top eight, but I think I ended up 11th and I was like, wow, I got, that was awesome. Like I, I got to swim with all these <laughs> super elite guys and the stadium was packed and it was super cool. Um, any of those meets that had a lot of high pressure, I think were some of my most vivid for sure. But yeah. And I, I love that you said dual meets. I feel like a lot of people who um, end up stepping away from the sport and swim in the NCAA system will point to that. They're, they'll either say dual meets or conference meets because yeah. it is more of a team atmosphere. And and anyone you talk to who's swimming called, it's like, this is, this is why you swim. You know, this is like one of those, right. the really high points. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why 
um, I'm probably stepping away is because I, I, I don't have that team aspect now that I'm swimming individually. Yeah. You have team USA, but um, you know, those every two weeks swimming for your team going up against Michigan. I mean, that was just the most exciting thing to me being part of a team um, has definitely been my favorite part of the sport. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. Like in a, a business organization now is, is being part of a team for a, a common goal. And obviously when Coley left Alabama, we had four people in our training group and we weren't some of the college team anymore. And it's for me, that social aspect swimming is already such a, a lonely, I would say lonely because a lot of people find it very socially um, simulating, but it, it's not like basketball. You don't get to talk to your teammates. You don't get to, you know, uh, socialize with them at any given point. You're looking at the black line. So as much as you can bring in that team aspect out of practice, the more I liked it. So swimming is for people. I mean, I love the people. I love Ryan and I love Margo and them, but it's just not the same as when you're swimming with a group of 30. So and I even felt that at energy standard, they have a great thing going, but something about me wanted that team aspect again. So, yeah, did, did, you know, especially for training wise, I don't, yeah, it's hard to replace a college team. Like you said, that team of 30, right. but did you get any, any sense or any similarity, uh, similar feeling, um, you know, competing in ISL for the DC Trident? Yeah, no, the, the team aspect of that is great. I think we, we had the team as the first year of ISL was fantastic. I mean, you had the team aspect, you had the fans, the fans in Italy were, were insane. Um, I'm sure anybody you've talked to that went there would say the same thing or in Budapest, but we didn't have that at this last season. And obviously there's a lot of reasons why we didn't have that. And I'm not saying we should have, but missing that is also another thing that kind of, it, it, like I said earlier, the more pressure the meet, the more exciting it was for me. Um, and it, you kind of miss that when you don't have the fans, you, you, you don't really have that. And I think a lot of sports are struggling with that right now. I mean, you have, that's why people are adding all these fan noises to some of the stadiums, like, cause the athletes miss that. They, they love that. That's why they do it. They're, they're performers. So, um, but the team aspect of DC was great. ISO was great. We had the most team atmosphere out of anyone. So it was nice to have that back for sure. It's a little different when you're not training with them and you're just competing with them, but it was still a great experience. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited for, for ISLs in the future and hopefully, hopefully we get fans back eventually. Um, right. So, I mean, to, to wrap things up, you, you've had a really cool, really successful swimming career. Do you feel like, at this point, there are things that you can point to. You have things you can point to that, that you're like, I'm going to take this with me um, and that I gained from swimming, um, you know, into, into my other endeavors. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for a lot of people, they're like, oh, I'll take my, you know, hard work and work ethic that I've gotten. And for me, it's, it, I feel like it's, swimming got me to a point where I'm able to appreciate things a lot more because, you know, I was able to do something at such a high level that a lot of other people try to do and can't. And I think swimming has made me realize to appreciate that for whatever it gave me for the downs and ups that it gave me. And I think that's something that I'm going to take with me is just learning to appreciate kind of what you have and what you've been able to do. And if you're able to appreciate something, you, you work harder at it. So, you know, once I do find somewhere where um, it fits all the categories that I want as far as work goes, I'm, I'll obviously appreciate that because I know there's a lot of people that wanted that opportunity and maybe didn't get it. So I think that's the biggest thing for me because I, I see a lot of people in the sport. I'm not, there's a lot of people that really, really, really love swimming. And I'd say I really, really love swimming. You know, there's just a different level. There's threes and then there's the twos and then there's the ones. <laughs> and I think seeing that around me, it makes me learn to appreciate that I was able to get to that level, even though I might've just been a really, really instead of a three. So it's being able to see that um, definitely, I think is going to help me in, in a lot of ways in the future. That's, 
such a great way. I, I love that description. That's such a great way to say it. And uh, cause, cause really you know, everybody like really loves swimming if they're still doing it. I mean, the, the compensation for swimming is, is not like another, you're not going to suffer through it. Like you might basketball when you're making 15 million years. So everybody really loves swimming, but then there's tiers of it. And I just don't think I was ever at that top tier. So being able to still do the sport at such a high level really made me appreciate kind of what I was able to do. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's great insight. Yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, well, Ian, thank you again for taking the time to sit down and chat any parting thoughts before we sign off today. No, I mean, I, I think that covers most of it. Um, I, I, it's not really a for sure goodbye because I'll, I'll, I'll make a little shout out to my training partner in energy standard. I mean, I see Felipe swimming at an elite level of 35. So there's, you see Tom Brady, winning Super Bowls at his age. So I think in a lot of ways, it's going to change in the future what can be done at what age. So I don't feel like it's a for sure, more than likely it's a for sure, but there's always an opportunity for it in the future. So I don't feel like I'm completely losing it. So go from there. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.